Welcome to Good Libations. We have a nice episode in store for you today. As you know, this is our show that deals with making truly fine cocktails and hopefully unique cocktails. And I'm Ethel Andrews, I'm a mixologist, and we're gonna discuss some cocktails that we have made in the past today with the different nuances as we have done on a previous show. In fact, on the show that we did previously, I made mojitos once again, but with the addition of fresh strawberry. Because again, that kind of kicked up the mojito a bit. It kept it as a pleasantly tart, minty beverage, but with just that nice addition of strawberry. And also another cocktail was made, as we know, that dealt with, um, well, I called it a margatini because it has nuances of both a margarita and a martini. And, and it involved um, muddling and infusing jalapeno with tequila. And of course, adding the orange-based liqueur, fresh orange juice, fresh lime juice, and a bit of olive brine. And we're gonna go in a similar direction in this show, but involving, of course, different cocktails and different drinks. This time, I'm going to redo a whiskey sour, which we have done in a previous show. But it's gonna be a different kind of a whiskey sour. And as you know, my original whiskey sour is different too. It's what they call an Eastern sour. Because instead of using some horrible lemon derivative, again, I use fresh lemon in it, and of course sugar, and bourbon, and I also add orange to it, which is not traditionally done with a whiskey sour. But with this particular one, I'm gonna add fresh cherries to it, which will kick it up a notch, and again, it will add a different nuance to it, and it will make it enjoyable in a unique sort of a way without compromising what it basically is. And we discussed the fact too when we originally made whiskey sours that adding a maraschino cherry is traditional. And people wonder why that is. Well, for some reason, cherries just kind of work with whiskey sours. So we're gonna actually, actually use real cherries today and to kind of let you know too, you can substitute canned cherries, but they should be pie cherries so that they're tart. You don't want a canned cherry that is kind of macerated and you know doesn't have texture anymore. And you wanna make sure that it has tartness to it and it doesn't taste sickly sweet. Because again, that's gonna compromise the whiskey sour and what it, what it should be in its totality. And again, making drinks in a different style is not wrong, as long as, again, the base alcohol fits what you're making, and also that the nuance that you add doesn't detract, but rather makes the drink evolve into something unique, but you can still touch base with what it originally was. And that's a good thing. And the second drink that we're gonna make, we know Irish coffees are immensely popular and of course they were made popular by a certain establishment in San Francisco that we'll talk about also. But I'm gonna actually make a Scottish coffee, which I prefer because I like the peat flavor of scotch. And I do like Irish whiskey as well, but I prefer that peatiness of the scotch. And I think it makes a richer drink with a different dimension. And we're gonna discuss what we did before when we made White Russians about pouring heavy cream so that you have a float. And most of the time it works, and I hope it works today as it did previously, but we shall see. But anyway, we're gonna get down to the business of making a different style of a whiskey sour. And again, traditional whiskey sours are made simply with bourbon or whatever you know analogous distilled spirit works for people that's within the realm of whiskey. It could be Canadian whiskey, it could be rye, for that matter. Um, it could be an American blend, but I like to use bourbon in my whiskey sours. And usually they simply involve fresh lemon, as they always should, you know, not um, sweet and sour mix, a bit of sugar, and it, with the Eastern sour that I make, they also involve fresh orange juice, but it's a hand-squeezed segment of the orange, not a juiced one, as, as I've done on you know, a previous episode. 
And again, we're going to add cherries to our whiskey sour and see how that works out. And for me, I like to make my whiskey sours in a shaker and I like to divest the entire contents into a glass that is suitable for a whiskey sour. And usually, you know, that's a tumbler. And in fact, I'm going to get into my little um, stock of glasses here and pull out a tumbler. Well, I actually pulled out the coffee, you know, glass first of all. And now here's the tumbler, the, the half and half glass for the whiskey sour. And I like to divest it, ice and all, into the tumbler. But anyway, here's how we will go about it. And again, for the benefit of the audience, rather than doing the, the free pour thing, I'm going to use the top, you know, of my um, martini shaker as um, a measure. And this is such a nice style martini shaker for that very reason, because you can use the top to measure the alcohol and the other ingredients also. At any rate, we're going to add the bourbon. And we'll add it in the amount of um, the entire shaker top. And at this point in time, just so we're careful, I'm going to add the ice. And amazingly, the ice is cooperating tonight. And again, this might seem awkward. Why don't you just simply put the ice on the table? It's not realistic because typically if you're doing, you know, a bartending gig or serving, you know, a group of friends in your backyard, the ice is going to be stored properly in an ice chest again. And I know I lecture endlessly about this or a bar refrigerator to keep it cold and to keep it from diluting and messing up the drinks and you losing your quantity of ice. And I'm going to add just a little bit more. And again, mixology has its awkward moments. And one of the moments is perhaps when you dig that ice out of, you know, the ice chest. But that's just the way it goes. And again, we're going to slice into our lemon. And I like to add a good amount of lemon um, into my whiskey sour. So I'm going to hand squeeze half of a rather large lemon into it. And again, I'm going to divest the shell in the shaker. And I'm going to add a good amount of sugar. And I've mentioned this before on several previous episodes, but when it comes to adding sugar, you're going to have to add a bit more um, than you would if you're using simple syrup. And simple syrup has its good points, but as you know, I have a certain preference for sugar. The granulation, I think, it adds a certain dimension, you know, with different drinks. And that's why I, I choose to use it over simple syrup. And I mentioned this before, but on an upcoming episode, I'm going to show you how to make simple syrup. You know, you have to add a certain amount of sugar and a certain amount of water, and you have to cook it, literally, until it reduces down into a syrupy consistency with no granulation. And it's good, and most people find it more user-friendly, but I feel a bit differently. And again, I'm going to add orange to my whiskey sour because it becomes an eastern sour then. It popular on the eastern coast. East Coast, this is, this is the style in which they make a whiskey sour. Squeeze at least a quarter of an average orange into the drink. And, you know, like with the lemon, you want to really work on it and infuse the oil out of the peel. Divest the entire thing into the shaker. Now this time, we're going to add some cherries. And again, if possible, it's good to use fresh cherries. But if you have only access to a canned cherry for whatever reason, it may be where you are, it may be the season of the year or whatever, 
you can use a canned cherry as long as it's a pie cherry and it has tartness to it. And we'll have to work on these cherries a little bit in the shaker. In fact, I don't have my muddler with me today, so I'm just going to use a spoon and I'm going to kind of crush those cherries a bit, especially against the, the side of the shaker, because that's going to get the juice out. And fortunately, I was smart enough to pit them <laughs> before the show. So again, they're going to add their own dimension to the drink, again, without compromising what the drink should actually be. So we're going to go ahead and shake this up in the martini shaker, which is, again, my preferred way of actually doing the whiskey sour. And a lot of people like to, you know, shake these with two hands. I don't find that necessary. Shaking them with one hand is good enough. And again, ice and all, we're going to make sure that we um, divest the contents of the shaker. I might just do what is in the shaker a bit. And sometimes, literally, you have to shake these shakers to get all the stuff out. And then we're going to make sure that some of the ice gets in there and some of the spent shell. I'm going to have to actually drink a little bit off of this. And again, if you have this particular style of a whiskey sour, it's a real adventure. And what I might do in this case, because the spent shell was a bit awkward, is add a bit of lemon. And again, add a bit of orange, and these act as garnishes also. And when you squeeze them, again, you're working that oil out of the peel. And again, you have a unique whiskey sour. It has a different sort of a hue because of the cherry. And it has a different sort of a taste. But the taste, again, is really unique and really good. It blends with the bourbon. It actually is suitable to use with a whiskey sour. And it produces a drink that is slightly different with a different dimension. So again, that's, that's another variant of a whiskey sour that you can make. And some people have also added, added um, apricot brandy, peach schnapps, and you can also add um, Kirschwasser, which is a German version of cherry water, to them, like I sometimes do with my tropical drinks. There's many things that you can do to kind of kick up a whiskey sour and make it your own signature drink. And don't be afraid to do things like that either. And again, there's always the caution of making sure that it fits the base liquor. But by the same token, be adventurous. Go beyond what people typically do, and you will find that you're making drinks that people really enjoy and are different, and you're putting your signature on them. This is your drink. That's how you know mixologists even work in upscale establishments, is they're not afraid to look beyond the norm, we'll put it that way, or the average, and to add those nuances to the drink. So think the same way. You know, think as you do. If you really enjoy cooking, as an example, and creating different sorts of dishes, typically as years go on, the more confidence you get. You're going to put your own spices, your own flourishes in that particular signature dish that you make, and people really enjoy that. And it becomes a challenge for them, too, to figure out what's in there. Sometimes they can if they have a good palate. Sometimes they can't. And it's the same thing with cocktails. Sometimes people who have a good palate can figure out what you've done with that drink to turn it into something slightly different. Sometimes they can't. And again, it makes you the person that you are. And always remember, mixology is not out of range or out of reach for anyone. As long, again, as you enjoy what you're doing and you're sensible about it and adventurous about it, you can produce really fine, unique drinks. And again, we're going to go a completely different direction, and we're going to make a drink that is actually a dessert drink, or it can be, in some cases, a breakfast or a brunch drink as well. And the most common form of this drink is an Irish coffee. 
Now there's Kiyoki coffees also, which involve brandy and rum and other ingredients. And those are worthy drinks. I love them. In my particular case, again, I actually prefer a Scottish coffee based on Scotch whiskey. And again, you don't have to go out and get the finest Scotch whiskey that is produced. In fact, if you use a single malt, it's kind of like the same principle with other drinks, like with margaritas. You could use, you know, a really, really fine tequila, but that is actually meant for sipping, and it's not going to necessarily make a really good margarita. The same principle with Scottish coffees and Irish coffees. It's not wise to use a single malt scotch. It's actually, it, it shows more wisdom to use a scotch that is quality, but one that is not out of reach of most people. And the flavor, again, that accompanies that drink is good. And it might seem, well, why even bother making this on the air? Because actually, all you're doing is making coffee, adding sugar, and adding, you know, the liquor, whatever it may be, whether it be Irish coffee, bourbon, or scotch, or Canadian whiskey for that matter, or the Kiyoki coffee, the brandy and the rum and the other ingredients. But there's more to it than meets the eye. There's certain steps that we have to go through to ensure that this drink is really going to be top quality. And I'm going to say one thing from the get-go. Do not use aerosol so-called whipped cream. I mean, that is like using cheese whiz in a dish that requires brie or extra sharp cheddar. You're using cheap ingredients and they're going to compromise and destroy the basic principle behind what you're making. That's why I insist on using heavy cream. And you can pre-whip the heavy cream to a certain degree to ensure that you're going to get, you know, a line of demarcation and it's not going to work its way into the drink. But I prefer to do the old-fashioned me method of pouring it over an inverted teaspoon. And again, it may work or it may not work. But we're going to demonstrate the steps that are necessary to make a truly good whiskey-based coffee. And first of all, we're going to have to get our coffee going. And one thing that is really important is we want to make strong coffee. So when we make it in a typical coffee maker, and you can do other things too. You can use a coffee press. You can use whatever method that you wish to to make good coffee. But you want to make sure that the coffee beans are fresh, basically, and you grind them yourself if possible. And you want to add a sufficient amount that you're going to have a strong cup of coffee. In fact, if you overdo, that's not going to be a problem. If you underdo with the coffee, again, you're going to have an insipid whiskey-based coffee, and you don't want that. So anyway, we're going to go ahead and put some water in here. Wherever I have hidden my water bottle. And by the way, this is not um, a water bottle that has um, sparkling water in it anymore. This is a water bottle that actually has regular water in it. But for, you know, the point of um, being able to um, transport your water easily, that's what we're going to do. Just a bit more to make sure that we get a full glass and we've got it on. And because this is kind of a broken <laughs> coffee maker, I'm going to have to put the um, lid back on. And again, we want it to be strong. We don't want weak coffee. Strong is imperative, you know, to make a successful whiskey-based coffee. And in the meantime, what we're going to do while the coffee is brewing is we're going to add the whiskey. And I'm going to do a free pour, and this is a relatively narrow, small, um, we might say Irish coffee, Kiyoki coffee mug. But where the, the place where I pour to is about where it should be. And again, we don't want a weak whiskey coffee. So there it is. And again, we're going to add sugar at least a couple of heaping teaspoons, even to this size of a glass. 
and we're going to wait for that coffee to brew up. And in the meantime, with the heavy cream, you can handshake the container. You can actually use, you know, a whisk or whatever to kind of get the cream a bit heavier. But we're going to attempt what may be impossible or maybe workable. We're going to have that um, nice inverted teaspoon pour, hopefully, over the top. And again, we always want to make sure that our coffee is strong. And overdoing and adding a lot of grounds is actually a good principle to go by. Because otherwise, again, you're going to have a very insipid, you know, Irish, Scottish, or Kiyoki coffee or whatever. And, you know, in some establishments, and I think with the American public in general, people tend to like Bailey's coffee and, you know, other milk-based, <laughs> for lack of a better term, um, beverages that involve those type of things. And they're fine, but they tend to be a little sickly sweet, and they kind of um, defeat the purpose of what an Irish coffee or you know, a whiskey-based coffee is supposed to be all about. And incidentally, the Irish coffee, as legend goes, was concocted, at least on the West Coast, at the Buena Vista in San Francisco, which is a wonderful establishment. The food is good, the breakfasts are legendary, and the people that they have working there, I mean, they look like they're out of a movie set without the self-conscious pretentiousness with a lot of people who are involved in show business. And again, this beverage was purportedly invented there, at least on the West Coast, but I kind of have a feeling that whiskey-based coffees have been around for a very long time, way before the Buena Vista even existed, and certainly most establishments in the United States even, even existed, because these beverages are found everywhere. They're ubiquitous in Europe. I mean, you could even go to South America or wherever, and you will find these beverages. But anyway, we want to pour in our coffee at this point in time, the strong coffee. Just the right amount. And again, at this point in time, we want to really stir to try to dissolve the sugar. And of course, sugar tends to dissolve more easily in a hot medium anyway. So this should dissolve very, very nicely. And now, we're going to attempt what we hope is possible, but sometimes is not possible. We're going to attempt to pour the heavy cream by inverting the teaspoon um, over the Irish coffee, or the Scottish coffee, I beg your pardon, in this particular case. And again, if this does not work, you know, don't feel crestfallen because you can always whip it up a bit and kind of slide it onto the top of the drink, but I'm hoping this will work. We'll see. Well, it wasn't entirely cooperative, but it was fairly cooperative, and it tends to be drifting towards the top, which is a good thing. And again, that is a truly fine whiskey-based coffee. And again, I'm going to emphasize, perhaps overemphasize, it could be an Irish coffee, it could be a Scottish coffee, it could be Canadian whiskey, it could be bourbon. Blended whiskeys, not so desirable. Kiyoki coffee ingredients, very desirable. And just to kind of review with both of these cocktails, in the whiskey sour that we had the addition of fresh cherries to, you can use canned cherries, but they should be pie cherries, they should be tart. And you want to use fresh lemon, you want to use bourbon, you want to use some orange. And you want to shake it over ice in a shaker. And you can use the shaker top, again, as your measuring um, device, as you would, you know, a shot glass. And you want to divest the ice. First of all, it's best to divest the actual liquid via the sieve or via the shaker, and then you can add um, the ice to it. And of course, some people who are professional bartenders like to use the Boston shaker, so-called, where you shake with a glass, and sometimes even a glass over a glass, slightly, one slightly smaller. And then you use the um, sieve over the top of the shaker, 
you know, to divest the ingredients. And of course, that's, t that's faster and it's more user friendly in many ways because you don't have to worry about prying that top, you know, off the top of the shaker, which can be very onerous and very difficult. So in that particular case, it might be advantageous to use the Boston shaker, but you don't have to. There are no rules. Some people feel that they're really showing their professional chops if they use that Boston shaker, that glass over a glass or a glass over the shaker. But you're really not proving anything unless your drink turns out good. That's the main thing that we want to look for. We want to educate our palates as we do with food, the same way with drinks. We want to make sure that what we're making and what we're producing is something that is worthy of other people's tasting. And we want it to be something, if possible, slightly different. And if we're making things that are conventional, we want it to be, again, different in the sense that we're not using those dreadful mixes. And how much more trouble really is it, and I've mentioned this before on previous shows, to use fresh lemon in a drink and sugar versus sweet and sour mix. Oh yeah, it might be easier to go out, that, go out and buy that bottle, but you've got citric acid and God knows what else in that particular concoction, that chemistry lab brew, we'll put it that way. Whereas if you just simply squeeze the lemon, you're getting the infusion of the oils from the peel, you're getting the juice, and you're getting all that loveliness associated with using fresh ingredients in a drink. And I want to uh, mention too that in previous sh in, um, shows that we're going to have forthcoming, some of them will be based on previous shows in that we're going to be revisiting certain drinks and remaking them in a different style. But by the same token too, we're also going to move on as we did in a previous show and make cocktails that are unique and that are different and that have our own signature or that maybe we've found somebody or discovered somebody else doing that we've decided we're going to add our signature to it as well. And again, this, this should always be an education of the palate and it should be fun. We don't want to turn this into something that is onerous and difficult, but we do want to keep it within the realm of what is adventurous and what is creative. So as we move on in our adventures in uh, making cocktails, we want to make sure that we do so always in an adventurous way and in a unique way. And thank you again for tuning into another episode of Good Libations. And again, I'm Ethel Andrews, I'm a mixologist. And I want to uh, mention, as I always do at the conclusion of every show, make sure that we drink responsibly and are very careful in our consumption. Thank you again. Bye-bye.